Okay, we'll ask uh, everyone to take their seats, please. We have a different CBC reporter now. Okay, welcome everybody to the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. This is our uh, public briefing um, with regard to the Diamond Policy Framework with the Honourable Minister Wally Schumann, from the, uh, with the Minister responsible for the Industry, Tourism and Investment. Um, to kick things off, I'll ask uh, members to introduce themselves for the record and I'll start over on my far left. Oh, sorry. Uh, Shane Thompson, Hendy, welcome. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Aaron Tester, member for Cam Lake. Good afternoon, Danny McNeely. Uh, Mr. McNeely represents the Saw Two. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. R.J. Simpson, MLA, Haver North. Uh, and welcome. My name is Corey Vanthine. I am the MLA for Yellowknife North, and we also have with us today from. Uh, Research uh, Kathleen Knuch, who is a um, brand new uh, researcher for our committee. And I, we also have from the clerk's office uh, Mr. Michael Ball. And so, and uh, I'm sorry, maybe as well for the record, Herb. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome again, Herb Nakamak from the Nakbut. All right, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Minister, for opening comments and to introduce your staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With, with me today is Deputy Minister of Department of Industry, Tours, and Investment, Tom Jensen, as well as the Department's Assistant Deputy Minister responsible for Minerals and Petroleum Resources, Pam Strand, and the Manager of Diamond Secondary Industry Development, Miles Walsh. Also in attendance this afternoon is the Department's Director of Diamonds, Royalties, and Financial Analysis, <coughs> Tiffany Hall, and my special advisor, Melissa Sear. The Department is pleased to provide this briefing today on the amendments that it has made to the Northwest Territories Diamond Policy Framework. We look forward to highlighting how these changes will support the growth of our Northwest Territories diamond manufacturing industry to see it generate training and employment opportunities and create business and investment opportunities to grow and diversify our economy. Our rough diamonds offer a unique resource worth as much as $150 million a year to our economy. We recognize that previous investments and initiatives in this sector have not succeeded in sustaining an operating environment for our secondary industry to flourish. But while some options may be critical, opinions might be critical of continued investment in this area, I believe that the Department would, let, would be remiss and it's public responsibility if all efforts are not taken to realize at least a portion of this economic potential. Our investment at this time is a policy change. It is a new approach that we think will allow us to realize the vision that we have along held that for this sector with no direct financial investment. With the Chair's permission, we have a presentation that we would like to provide, after which we would be happy to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. And can I ask who will be leading your presentation today? Miles. Mr. Welsh, okay. And just a couple reminders for those who may not have been in the room for some time. Uh, the exchange of conversation will go through me as the chair. There's no need for anybody to have to uh, touch their microphones. Our audiovisual technician uh, does a good job of that when the conversation is exchanged uh, through the chair. And so, uh, and I would also ask uh, folks to refrain from uh, clicking pens. Clicking pens gets picked up very quickly on the microphones, so I appreciate that. Without further ado, Mr. Welsh, I'll turn it over to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll actually turn it to uh, the Deputy Minister to do an introduction. No? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, in the following slides that I, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, in the following slides uh, that I believe you all have, what I'd like to do is, is walk you through the process that we've undertaken as we've uh, worked on these policy amendments. I'll touch on a bit of the background. I'll also touch on our current environment, the vision we have, um, the case for change, 
um, the actual policy review itself and our, and our, our decisions going forward. Um, so if we look back uh, in the background of, uh, in the first slide or slide two, um, we're all aware that the Diamond Policy Framework was established in 1999. There was a, another review taken of the Diamond Policy Framework back in 2010, and that was quite, quite extensive as well, uh, involved all the stakeholders. Uh, one of the principal ones that came out of that one was that the, uh, the, uh, the authority to designate uh, approved Northwest Territories diamond manufacturers was delegated down to the, the minister and not through a, a committee anymore. So what it does essentially is, is it defines the scope of the operations for diamond manufacturers in the Northwest Territories. So if we can move on to slide three, what we have to understand is that the, the policy now is, is 19 years old. Uh, the industry has changed, uh, the Northwest Territories has changed. Our, our goals are similar, but uh, our approach is, is different. We need to maximize the benefits for the NWT. I think um, previously the, the, the policy was quite focused, perhaps narrowly, on creating jobs. What we're looking at here is a bit of a different approach where we can have a more diverse operating environment where our manufacturers can expand outside. Manufacturing will remain a component, but they can expand outside of manufacturing. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit as we go forward. Just remind folks the slide number as you move through it. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So we'll move on to slide five. Thank you. Um, and we'll just talk a bit about the current environment. So the NWT is the most expensive jurisdiction in the world to operate. So we understand that and we know there are, are challenges in that regard. Um, diamond manufacturing, for, for a bit of background on that, is, is uh, dominated by mostly low-cost manufacturing centers. Um, in, re in India, for example, they are responsible for manufacturing 90% of diamonds by volume in the entire world. They have that mass market there. Um, and the per carat costs make it difficult here. For example, uh, the Approximate cost per carat to manufacture a diamond in the Northwest Territories is $300 compared to approximately $80 a carat in India. But uh, there's still interest in the NWT and manufacturing the NWT, and that's bolstered by the very stable operating environment and political environment we have here in Canada. Um, of course, an access to a consistent supply of rough, which we can offer them, and the marketing opportunities that come with that. Um, we understand that the NWT can't compete with these markets for mass production, and we want to focus on smaller scale factories, niche marketing, again, back to the diverse ideas. So that's the environment now. So if we move on, we'll talk a bit about the vision we've developed as we, as we started, started going forward with this. So what we realized we had to do was is think of the diamonds in terms of an asset, and we need to leverage that asset. What the, the producers are responsible for providing up to 10% of their production for manufacturing for local manufacturers. The 10% is estimated at approximately 150 million US dollars a year. And our goal is to ensure that this policy supports with, with uh, leveraging that asset, we want to make sure the policy supports the development of a successful, sustainable, and diverse secondary industry. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we see manufacturing more of a component of the diverse secondary industry success. We can see it driving population growth and skill development. The diverse in industry opportunities, it can include things like tourism, jewelry manufacturing, retail, lots of options there. And there's also a, a new one in this, in this vision that we had was the uh, supporting the operations where they do high skill planning and lasering and we'll, like I said we'll talk a bit about more about all these options as we move along. So if we go to slide seven and it, it's a case for change so I, I think uh, most of us are aware a bit about the history of manufacturing in NWT and, and we know we've been met with challenges and the reality is there is no one in the Northwest Territories currently managing rough that is available through these agreements with manufacturing. I mean, with the producers. So our previous policy has been 100% mine cut and polished in the NWT. And we knew that we need to look at that, but we need to consider a new way to do business. We needed to be creative and, and flexible. What we need to do is think of a way to make the environment more attractive and more sustainable for the manufacturers. So if we can just move on to slide number eight. So we, we took it from the approach that we do not want additional GNWT investment. So we, we took it from the approach of a policy perspective. What we need to have to 
be able with, to ensure that we can do is have a policy that's flexible and can adapt to market conditions. And the most important thing, and I think you'll hear me reiterate this, this throughout the presentation, is think outside rough to polished. Diversify, let's, let's, let's leverage this asset and make it work with the manufacturing as a component. So if we can move on to number nine, well, and we talk about sustainable diversification. So what we see in, in our discussions, internal discussions, being the outcome of all this work, is we have the opportunity here for population growth. We have potential new retail and tourism opportunities, and there's also additional revenue generation, whether it's through the population growth, uh, capital investment, and uh, one of the bigger ones we think is uh, local operating expenditures with, with manufacturers working here in the NWT and spending locally. That, that, that's a great potential for revenue generation. So if it's okay, I'll move on to number 10. We'll talk a bit about the policy review. So we looked at the policy in-house, and although the GNWT does have diamond experts, a better understanding of how of the global market was required. We needed to understand what was going on in India, what was going on in Botswana, and then maybe these other beneficiation regions, how they were making it work and what we could do. So this global understanding is required, and through the uh, public RFP process, we engaged the Constell Group, a group of... Uh, uh, international diamond consultants. So I think it was about this time last year and over the next several months there were a great deal of consultation done and what we made sure we reached out to all our stakeholders. We talked to everyone within the GNWT, our office, uh, previous manufacturers, we've also met with the minister, we talked with the producers and, and the key one was the other industry experts in other regions as well. And uh, following that the Constell were provided us a copy of their report and in there there was a series of policy recommendations and like new ideas and uh, they were all presented in that report and so we had a quick look, at, not a quick look, we had a thorough look at those and if we can just move on to number 11 we can talk a bit about them as well. So there were several new ideas were presented and analyzed so when we were looking at this report we were thinking okay these are all really proactive, we're not just it's not just two things we can do, there's a whole bunch of stuff here we can try. But we thought, what can we do now and what can we build on? And we decided to focus on the three ideas and uh, of an export provision and the concept, it, it was in the report as beneficiation versus allocation, but it's once again back to that rewarding diverse investment. And the other one that they were very supportive of was encouraging that high value, high skilled diamond planning and lasing, lasering operations. So we're, we're excited about all those, and you see there, there's several more, but like I said, we could, we're very excited to, to build on these. I think if we focus on these first three with the manufacturers we have, we can start to, to build off those with some, with some short-term success. So as we move on to uh, slide 12, it's actually slide 12 and 13, I'll talk a bit about the, the export provision. So the Constell Group, when they, pardon me, when they gave us uh, their report, they indicated that no, no matter what, an export provision was critical to any long-term success in the Northwest Territories. This is not new to us, this is something manufacturers had asked for from the beginning of the uh, diamond industry in the NWT, and if we go back through the 19, I mean the 2010 review, you could see that was uh, uh, something they'd asked, and this has been persistent uh, uh, throughout the history of diamonds in NWT, is the ability to export NWT rough diamonds. So we considered that and we realized our goal is not to be a diamond broker. We're not here to be the middleman to get them their diamonds so they can go manufacture them somewhere else. Manu manufacturing and investment quotas would be required. So working with internally with our team, our, our diamond team and a lot of our uh, trade people and our uh, uh, economic analysts, we identified four key investment areas. So when you're thinking of what, what's, the most, what's the best for the NWT in a new operation, we, we, we're talking about employment operating expenditures, capital expenditures, and once again, that diverse investment. Um, and to ensure consistency and, and, and such, a transparent mechanism and methodology would be required to, to calculate this export provision. We couldn't just say to someone, give us your, your uh, business, an, a business plan, okay, you can export X amount. No, we had to be transparent with them and with the public so they can understand how we came to this. And of course, we'll have more on that as well. I want to, uh, as we move through, I want to touch a bit more, if, move on to slide 14, sorry. <coughs> thank you. And, uh, and, and about the diverse investment. So 
we want to encourage these divestments and rewarding manufacturers, which could be with the, the export allocation for their investment, will actually encourage them to diversify. We can see now that uh, with the one manufacturer here, the Crossworks Manufacturing, their diamond center, they've done a lot of work. They've diversified. They have their diamond interpretive center, and they have a, 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 a successful retail operation there as well. And to encourage other manufacturers to take the same approach, we decided to reward this diverse investment. We, you know, we touch on retail, jewelry, and tourism opportunities. But here in discussions with the manufacturers, we've also indicated that we could be supportive of other industry investments as well, whether that's uh, uh, su uh, sponsoring trading programs. Uh, we've left that ourselves flexibility in the policy to look at anything that would support a diverse investment. We really see this as, a, as a potentially a win-win for, for both parties. So if we move on, pardon me, to slide 15, I'll talk briefly about the new operating environment. So our new operating environment, as we've outlined in this policy, is, is a sea change from our previous position. And this policy, like I said, contains the flexibility that will allow the manufacturer to export rough. Now, just touching back again, any export is based on weighted, those weighted investment requirements, and new business plans will be required for from the a NDM. And you think you'll see that in the in the uh, slide there. A NDM must meet a minimum standard through this scale to be able to open an operation here in the Northwest Territories. So. While the policy doesn't contain an explicit export provision, it does allow us the flexibility to support that type of operation. So we're going to move on into the, the numbers and stuff we'll talk about as we get into our first uh, chart, and it's the assessment and export. And you'll see this table shows the range of scores and the associated export provision. And just, just note, too, that the scores are points, not percentages. The, the export provision is a percentage, but the score is actually just points. So the way we developed and weighted these, these key investment areas is we're hoping to see the majority of the proposals score in the 30 to 54 point range, which would allow them a 70% export. So it's not based on out of 100. So if you look at that and you see a score of 30, that's actually a solid business plan. If we, if we look at it really quickly, it's approximately four full-time equivalents, uh, a $750,000 capital investment, and a million-dollar operating expenditure for a factory. So a 30, although it's, it, it seems though there, that's the 30 to 54 range is what we're trying to push people into, and it's actually an excellent business plan. The maximum any manufacturer could export without diverse investment under this is uh, uh, probably, it would be, I think it's around a 75 score, which would be an 80% um, export allocation. But if you're going to look at that, that you're, you're getting an extraordinary investment from a manufacturer. We would have a factory of plus 20 people, $5 million in operating expenditures, mm -hmm. and potentially $2 million in capital expenditures. Um, again, 90%, although it seems a uh, it seems quite high. That's that would require an extraordinary investment, and we don't see that being a possibility. But of course, we have to account for it. Uh, I can look back and see. But that that is a, a factory of more than 20 people. The 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 absolutely extraordinary investment. So when we came through with all this, we said this is great. But how are we going to keep an eye on all this and control this? And to monitor this, we understood that stringent reporting would be required. Previously, we've monitored the rough through the factory, stone by stone, from, from, the, from the time it arrives in Yellowknife to the time it goes out. But things would change under this policy. So what we were, we were pleased is, fortunately with Devolution, uh, an audit unit came online with ITI, and the secondary industry joined this team in 2016. What this does, having that audit team in-house, gives us the skill to monitor these agreements under the framework. We now have the resources in-house to make sure we can monitor rough through and monitor those business plans. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about the key drivers and we'll, we'll and that's on slide 17, pardon me. So, as I said, the slide is key drivers. We like to... Mr. Walsh, just oh, one moment. Sorry. Question, Mr. Testart. Uh, thank you. Before we go any further, can you just uh, define diverse investment, just so I get a better sense of it? Nope. Okay, I'll just... Uh, we, we actually have... We, when we looked at the idea of diverse investment and what we have is this asset to share, we realized that could potentially affect trade agreements. So we talked to our business and, and trade team, and they have provided us with um, the correct definition so we, we can support these manufacturers and meet the obligations we have under any trade agreement. So a diverse investment is, and I'm going to quote this, an investment that provides a service 
trains or employs workers, results in the construction or expansion of particular facilities, or involves the carrying out of research and development in the Northwest Territories. Some examples, the jewelry retail business, a diamond tourism initiative, or an interpretive center, and the way we've handled the eligibility of any diverse investment application, they'll all be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, working with our trade team and our economic analysts. Thanks. Thank you. Nothing further? Oh, sorry. I'll carry on, sorry, Mr. Welsh. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Back Mr. You. Chair. I'll carry on. So I would like to talk again on slide 17, the key drivers, or as we'd like to call them now, the key investments. And as we said, we've, we've weighted them. Um, and if we, if we look at them, employment is, is the key factor, employment job generation. And if, if you're going to open a factory and, and take a diverse investment, you could potentially gain up to 40 points through this matrix use, uh, with, with your employment uh, with your hirings. Um, another big one is the operating expenditures. That's classed as like the, the second highest we think and it's worth worth 25 points. And what we've done for this, uh, for the policy and the definitions we've shared with the manufacturers, uh, an operating expenditure in this case for these manufacturers is an expenditure that must be incurred in the Northwest Territories. So if you have someone working in your factory and they need to go somewhere else and do something to support the factory, that doesn't count. All your operating expenditures must be incurred in the Northwest Territories. Um, the third most valuable one is probably the diverse investment. It says 15 here, but we have to also consider that you can get an additional 10 points for employment as well. Um, the capital, there is a potential here for locally for capital purchases. We know one of our manufacturers has, has made a substantial, has made substantial capital purchases in the Northwest Territories, but a lot of the manufacturers potentially could be more into leasing space. Um, a lot of their capital expenses will be uh, um, in using for specialized equipment that can't be purchased in the NWT. Now, we appreciate that they have to make that capital investment and bring <coughs> it in here, so we reward them with those uh, 20 points as well, but it, it doesn't factor in as high as the uh, operating expenses. So we've also provided in the next slides, and we can walk through them or you can have a look at them, but we've provided additional detail on the key investments scoring that includes the range and the points. From these, if you've looked at these or have a chance to look at these, you can see the investment required and the associated scores. So to, to come up with these ranges and these scores, once again, we worked with our economists and our trade people and the Constell Group. and and factored in what's going on in the NWT and associated costs to create those drivers. In the recent weeks, since this has all been, been signed off by the Minister, we've ta taken the opportunity to meet again with our manufacturing and our producing partners, and we've provided a similar presentation to this, and the, the response has been uh, overwhelmingly positive. We're, we're quite pleased. It is a huge change, and, and they understand that, and uh, it's good to see that, especially the producers, are supportive of the direction that we're going. Um, what we've done too is we've again followed up with our manufacturing partners and we're working with them and they're currently uh, updating their, their business plans. So what we talked to them, they already, they've already been through the application process, they, are, they have pre presented, we know their businesses are solid so we're not making them run through those hoops again. But what they have to do is they they've have copies of the matrix, they have copies of the drivers, they understand what's going on, they need to develop a business plan and work it through in that matrix, then we'll take it back and analyze it, and uh, we'll be working with them. As our goal is to get the existing manufacturers we have up and running right away. I think we're, we're quite confident uh, with, the, with the approach they're taking, and we think this is a really creative, and once again, the key thing is it's a flexible approach, and it's going to help us to achieve what we believe is a, a successful, sustainable, and once again, diverse secondary industry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we've gone through it all. Questions, right? Comments, questions, concerns from committee? Start with Mr. Testart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So on the, on the face of it, I, um, uh, I'm very impressed with the department's creativity in uh, applying uh, policy solutions to uh, a famously stubborn secondary industry in the Northwest Territories. So, um, and if the issue identified as export, then I think this is a clever way to get around. I do have some questions around that. Um, so how many carrots are we talking about that are going to be made available for export? Um, because if the, my read of it is, you know, the, the carrot to incentivize production here is you get to 
export time. It's like that's you get to export your quota. So that's that's the real way we're incentivizing the secondary industry. So how many how many carrots of, of rough are we talking about for export at the uh, let's let's go at the high end of, of the, the ninety percent uh, and all the way down to the presumed seventy percent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chair. Um, it's it, the way we've uh, structured these agreements is not the actual volume of carrots, it's the value. So, and the agreements that the, pr the manufacturers make with the producers are independent of what we, we, we don't par participate in those discussions, but there is $150 million available, and the manufacturers would work on that, and what we're working with is, is two manufacturers right now, and they can work through with the producers. And what we, what we see, what we envision is, the agreements have the the manufacturers have agreed to provide rough, which is technically uh, economic to manufacture in the NBT, and that's two and a half to ten between two and a half to ten carats. But there's a large range in there, and depending on what what the manufacturer is producing, what he's what his goal is, that that could all could all differ from that regard. So we can't really narrow it down to a carotage. Okay, thank you. Further, Mr. Tester. Yeah, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, so I was just looking for a useful, quantifiable source. But if we're talking about 150 million, is a lot easier for me to understand. So that's the amount we're talking about being made available for export. So, um, so that clarifies that. And I had questions around that 150 million dollar figure. Um, so let's take the example of, of Crossworks, which has been successful here. How many points would that would Crossworks and their operations score under this new policy? Just for an example of someone who's actually operating here. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what we have done is uh, to to test the, the matrix there is we've taken previous business plans. We don't have updated business plans, but we look at an operation like one like Crossworks was having, and they were, I believe, anywhere between six and nine employees. Um, they were leasing space, and we we uh, sort of uh, working with uh, retail rate. Uh, retail rental rates and that type of thing and the employees in that we estimated crossworks with their diverse investment would score approximately between 34 and 38.5 so they would be in that 70 percent range for export thank you further mr testart thank you um and uh, although not di directly related to the new policy, it is related to secondary diamonds. I'm just wondering if, if we can, what, what the progress is on Diamonds International. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a presentation from um, uh, the department on this new business opportunity. Many of the aspects you're trying to encourage with the policy of having a tourism center and uh, a high-end kind of polishing thing and, and feeding directly our, our, our tourism market, was, that was part of that investment. So. Um, what's what has happened with that uh, at, at this point in time? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Chair. We continue to work uh, diligently with uh, Diamonds International. Um, they are currently uh, they were one of the they are currently working on uh, upgrading their business plan. Since the time they met with you, they've they've purchased the, the factory out by the airport. They've purchased staff housing. They've lined up employees and trainers to come over to Yellowknife. Um, there were a lot of there were a great deal of difficulties originally with the immigration process to bring these individuals over, and then we started moving into the phase of developing and amending the policy framework and working. Working with them, and we've sort of been working towards getting this completed before, before bringing the people over and uh, and opening the factory. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Testart? A few, but I'll allow my colleagues to ask questions if they have. Next, I'll go to Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I agree that the uh, NWT could be viewed and experienced as a high operating area. For various reasons, probably one num number one is the high or the uh, climate. You have to leave your oil stove on 24 hours a day, for example, or your machine running all night. Um, have we uh, gathered any experiences there from what previous assemblies used to do there or did do with the manufacturing policy investment to what your new initiative is now? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Walsh. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, working with with the uh, with the, the Constell Group through this, um, their uh, their research. They didn't just speak to the minister himself. They've gone back. They've spoken to people from Arslany, and they've spoken to Tiffany, and they've gone back meeting with the previous manufacturers we've had as we, here, as well as other stakeholders we've had in the past. When they did this report, they went back to 1999 and came forward to 2016. So we've they did through their research track down all that that type of information and uh, generally speaking it, it is it is the economics of, of it and a lot of it has to do with 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 supply and ensuring that the quality of rough is there and the other uh, one is uh, like you said there there are a lot of uh, costs around maintaining the factory but labor costs are the most intensive one thank you further mr. McNeely Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess we, we, we have learned something from previous assemblies that would help support the accuracy of these uh, point measurements, correct? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you just repeat the question, please? Um, thank you, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess my, my, my question is uh, we have learned from previous assemblies that took the initiative of the polishing, polishing side of, uh, of, of the diamonds and learned from that exercise to support our percentage numbers in, in your presentation deck. Thank you. Thank you. Lessons learned from past policies. Mr. Walsh. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the, the research, the research I, I'm not 100% sure I understand the, the member's question, but what the research has done, as is, it's like I said, it's gone back and reflected on all of these, and to come up with the numbers for this new calculation, all that type of information was input into this matrix to develop this calculation. Is that the? Thank you. Yeah. Anything further, Mr. McNeely? Yeah, I, I recall um, there was a polishing operation set up here in Yellowknife, and it closed for whatever reasons undertaken by previous assemblies. Now that operation closure was closed for a, mar a variety of reasons. I, I don't know. I, I wasn't here other than just reading articles in the paper about this polishing uh, plant that was here in Yellowknife. So I'm just saying from that operation the government played a part in promoting that operation. So have we learned something from that operation that would help support your percentage numbers on your deck moving forward with this revised policy? Thank you. I'll go to Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the reason that, uh, that we've taken this evaluation process and brought this framework forward for <coughs> you guys is the diamond policy that has existed since 1999 clearly was not working for the manufacturers in the Northwest Territories. Uh, Miles has clearly laid out the, the factors that were holding these people back and the part of the problem, the biggest problem back in the, up to now is they had the allocation and they had to polish every diamond in the Northwest Territories the way the policy was written and they weren't able to make any money. So Miles and his team and the rest of ITI has gone away and came back with this proposal how we're moving forward that gives, a, gives the manufacturer the ability to meet certain matrix that we want to see invested in the Northwest Territories that benefits us as a territory yeah. around economic development, around employment, around training, all these sorts of things that's clearly laid out here, but at the same time give them an export provision that allows them to be successful and be profitable. Um, so that's the biggest thing, I think, because the policy never did work and the way things are right now, this $150 million a year is just getting sold outside of our territory and we're not benefiting from it. So that's why we've brought this new policy framework forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. McNeely? Uh, yeah, it, it sounds like we, we learned something through the process and we're losing money currently and we notify the, the losses. So that's why we're, we're taking a different approach. So I, I like the approach. If, if you found a weakness and uh, let's uh, patch the hole that's leaking 100, <coughs> 150 mil and capture that here with the uh, new revised policy. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Comment noted to the comment. Mr. Jensen? Yes, th thanks, Mr. Chair. So to the, to the member, um, I, I, I agree. I think we have learned uh, from the past, and I think one of the big learnings, as the minister has said, is that uh, the economics didn't work in the past because of the relative uh, differences in costs of manufacturing. And um, 
the uh, what the what our what we've added to that learning is that the uh, the consulting group, the international consulting group, Constell, who are not only consultants in the field, they actually they actually operate uh, factories internationally as well. So what we asked them to do was benchmark, to to rebenchmark the current costs of production. So the numbers we're using are uh, the current cost of production in different um, different jurisdictions, whether that's Namibia, Botswana, India, um, and of course Northwest Territory. So. Um, we brought all of those factors in and we now have a, a current picture of what the economics are and the only way that the economics work now is, as the minister has said is if if you allow them the business flexibility to to, to polish the higher valued uh, rough diamonds here to be able to export some to other polishing facilities that they have perhaps in an ideal uh, situation actually bring di some higher value diamonds in from others if they've got expert polishers here who have got, developed a niche around polishing so you know that's, this is going to take some time but I think what we're doing is we're setting the stage the basis for for a, a new approach where we can derive at least some value while we can maintain profitable um, uh, diamond tears or, or secondary manufacturers a really good example of this member is uh, is uh, Diamonds International. They are a vertically integrated uh, company. So now they came here uh, intending to to uh, to manufacture without this new policy. And they have a, 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 a vertically integrated operation where they they purchase, they polish, they manufacture jewelry, they sell jewelry, 120 or 130 locations internationally. So they are vertically integrated, and they are. They, they believe that they could actually make it work, but it's only because they, they add value in all, all the way along the value chain. What this policy does is it actually gives them even a better opportunity uh, to really solidify what it is they've been intending to do. And fair to say that some of their ideas around jewelry manufacturing and perhaps working with local um, indigenous designers, uh, opening a jewelry store, all of the kinds of things that they had talked about, uh, this actually enables that and actually gives them credit for doing that. Uh, and, and the credit being the ability to export a portion of that 10% that they okay. just So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Appreciate the explanation. Uh, next, I have Mr. Testart. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what What's the status of the polar bear trademark? Because um, I, my last recollection is that was being that was still held up in uh, uh, legal agreements or legal matters. Thank you. I, sorry, I, Mr. Chair, I ask because a component of this presentation, the new policy shift is uh, branding. So I'm assuming that's what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The status of it is that we're actually taking a look at the brand. Um, we have a, a, a contract, a consultant who's looking at, at to refreshing that brand, and we see a refreshment of that brand and how we can maximize use of it in tandem with this new approach uh, at some point, we're going to try to marry the two to see if we can gain value for that brand again through this approach. So it's it's going to be part of it in the future. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Thank you. Uh, so the uh, other issues that have been raised by the industry uh, or by the Diamonds uh, International um, example are these immigration issues. So what, what, part, what uh, policy changes are we advocating for either with our own... Um, uh, immigration policies that that are primarily focused around labor um, or with uh, advocacy to the federal government to uh, have a more streamlined entry system for uh, skilled workers who can participate in the diamond industry are we developing any specific proposals around that issue because it seems to be fairly significant at least in regards to this one business which has taken years to, to get online thank you Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, the member, for the for the question. Um, as the member has, has identified, the responsibility for um, the skilled worker provincial nominee program is with EC and E, and these folks would come in under. I'm not sure it's a provincial nominee program. It may be an accelerated program that's run by uh, run federally, but we don't have a particular proposal to them based on the experience that that this particular company is, has had. There's a number of a number of elements to it, and and I think um, I don't believe that um, Mr. Welsh was suggesting necessarily that 
that the immigration challenges were because of the way the federal government was was or was not processing those applications. It's just that uh, whatever they were doing, whatever consulting process they were using, however they did their applications, they experienced some delays and we weren't certainly putting any blame in terms of pointing to the federal government in that particular process. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Further, Mr. Testart? Okay, so what what were the delays then? I mean, if, if it wasn't the federal system, just, just the way the federal system is structured, because obviously that, that can create challenges for um, small jurisdictions like ours. So what were the delays then, and what are we doing to address them? And I, and I say this because the skilled, the, the, the diamond polishing, uh, the limited knowledge I know about this industry is that the skills are very limited to, to certain areas around the world. I think Ukraine has a large skilled population for that. Um, uh, some, some of the other names were, were mentioned earlier. Um, so given that there's the, the labor is isolated to particular political geographic realities, and if we're going to rely on you know, a certain amount of stones to be polished and manufactured here, we're going to need to, to find Armenia, uh, we're going to need to find that, that uh, some sort of entry mechanism. Otherwise, we're, we're always going to see similar delays. Um, so what are the problems and what are the solutions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there are a number of, uh, of streams, if you will, through the federal system. We have one where we nominate for, uh, for uh, um, um, entry our provincial nominee program. Um, but I'm not going to, we don't think we can comment really on what are the problems of the, of the national immigration system with respect to a handful of people that a particular company is trying to get into, uh, into the territory. Um, our, our immigration programs are always under review. We're fine tuning them. We have the business side of it. Um, but I don't think that, uh, we certainly haven't got into, the, into their file to the degree that I could actually comment on what the problem with the federal system is and what the solution to that federal system would be. I know that they've had, the company had some challenges in terms of the application process. Uh, the company was, I think, new to this process. So I don't think it, it would be fair for us to comment based on that particular situation uh, around what's wrong with the federal, uh, federal immigration system. So, but I take the member's point that I think we should always be looking at ways of improving it and making sure that we can bring skilled workers into the territory in an expedited way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the response. Now, look, I appreciate that this is the Department of Industry, Tourism, and Investment, and it's not the Department of um, ECNE, but this issue relates directly to secondary diamonds. Now, uh, I like the policy. I like what's being proposed. I think it's smart to find out what the incentives are and to work with industry on an incentive basis. You want your diamond exports? Give us some investment because you can more reliably get that than the job creation that was that was more designed. So uh, I fully support that. But there are other issues we're aware of as it relates to secondary diamonds. And I think the expectation, at least of myself, is that you can answer some of those questions when you come before a standing committee. And if ECE needs to be in the room, that's great. Um, I, I would like to ask questions about tax incentives and if we've considered tax incentives uh, for uh, investment of this nature, of a very specialized industry creating tax incentives, um, is the department or the minister prepared to speak to that issue or do we need to have an official from finance here? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the member for the question. No, we have not considered tax incentives uh, in this policy change. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Testart? Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I, I appreciate that this, this is a, a no-money initiative, and um, I, I think policy changes are important, but it's a more attractive uh, opportunity, I think, when you, when you do provide some ways to offset uh, those kind of investments. So not only do you get your quota, but you can potentially offset those with some tax, with a tax break, um, and not and perhaps coordinate those tax breaks with the federal government to lower the overhead. There's lots of opportunities for that. This government doesn't really look at uh, tax breaks too often or tax credits too often. They prefer direct subsidies. Um, I think we need to change that focus. Uh, tax breaks come after you've invested the dollars. And uh, they're, they're better than a limited pool of money that runs out at the end of the day. And I think if you, if you really want to build any kind of manufacturing where people have to, where businesses have to, uh, industry has to invest in people, places, and um, 
and research and development, those kind of things. The only way you're, you're really going to get them to, to go take that extra step is to provide those incentives. And I don't think the quote is enough for the full range of diverse investment you're, that, that we're looking for. So if you could consider a tax incentive um, or tax credit to offset either research and development costs or equipment costs, I'm assuming that much of this equipment is very specialized and expensive. That's, that's a way that uh, you might be able to, to incentivize more, uh, more investment. And if I'm wrong and they're only after the diamond quota, that's fine. But um, I think you should bring you know, all the tools you have as a government to this approach. Um, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. But it's just let, let's let's discuss. It's if, if we can't just be focused on the policy changes, we got to look at the the totality of the issues surrounding the secondary industry if we're going to make it a success. Thank you. Thank you. Comment noted to the comment, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So first thing, uh, this is outside the policy framework. Ta tax incentives are outside of this policy. One thing that uh, what we've clearly laid out here, and and I'll, I'll duly note his comment from the member, but. We haven't even given this thing a try yet. And uh, to say that we need a tax incentive to make this thing fully work, I don't think is justifiable. Um, talking to the manufacturers already, clearly what we've laid out, uh, they've never asked us for anything. We've had Inter Diamonds International that were prepared to come here before we even done this policy. And now that we've created this new framework around this, is is has caused a stir in the industry that people that actually have never even looked at the Northwest Territories and look at potentially coming here. So. I believe that we've laid out a framework that's laid out in our policy that clearly is going to work. And uh, in due course, if, uh, if I'm totally wrong, well, maybe we'll have to have a look at the, at the tax policy and bring the member of finance in here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, <coughs> to start with, um, I was on your website uh, a few nights ago, and I could at that point, I could still see the old policy. It seems to be gone now. Can you guys give us a copy of your old policy? Thank you. Yeah, we can Thank you. That, right? Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we can commit to doing that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, um, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, I guess it's taken me a while to try to figure out what's going on here, but because um, I only saw this uh, right now or during the, the, the briefing so um, it looks like under the old policy what we were doing was providing loan guarantees for companies that wanted to locate here is that what the old policy essentially was and that obviously didn't work so now we're moving to some kind of matrix based system that um, where the real carrot is access to the rough am I getting this right thanks mr. chair Thank you. Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, under the old policy, no, there were no loan guarantees. And to the matrix. Further Thank clarification, you. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks. So um, I thought there were loan guarantees, but maybe that was through BDIC or some other uh, instrument um, or body. But um, um, so. Uh, the, the, the only carrot that we really have to offer here is uh, access to rough. Is, is that, is that the, the, the carrot that we have? It, and that hasn't worked for the last 20 years, but that's, that's the carrot that we're offering. Thanks, so to speak. Thanks. Are these puns intended? No, that was not really intended. Because I think when I think of carrots, I think of what I grow in my garden. But I'd like to, to get from our uh, witnesses what why is why is a, is a diamond manufacturer going to want to get into this if is it just access to the rough? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think um, generally speaking, um, diamanteers want to get access to rough wherever they can get it. So they're always looking for sources of rough diamonds because their business is polishing. That's where they make their money. So I think the idea of access to rough is absolutely, uh, as uh, as the member says, at one of the carrots. Uh, in, in, in this, but um, they had access to rough under the old policy. It's just that they, it, they weren't able to economically um, uh, polish and manufacture the diamond. So what the, the new piece of this is, as Mr. Welsh has said, is the key to this is they now have access to a portion of the rough, 10% of, of what's produced in the territory. 
Uh, the valuing of that is around $150 million. So they have access to that uh, as a priority over others, so they get it first offered to them. Uh, and then what they have is an opportunity through, the, through uh, the, their capital investments, their operating investments, their diverse investments, their employment, and all of the things that are uh, in the matrix that we've put together give them credit on, a, on an on ascending basis, gives them credit to be able to re-export or export that rough. In the past, they didn't have the opportunity to export a share of that rough. They had to manufacture 100% of the 10% that they were allocated. Now, through the sliding scale and the investments and the matrix that we've put together, they can earn the right to start to export some of that rough, which means they can actually, in a, in a, in a much more sophisticated way, use that rough as a, as a leverage to be able to polish elsewhere, uh, sell, do other things with it so they have a, a broader business model by virtue of more flexibility, I think is the term Mr. Welch uses, uh, around the access to the rough and the use of that rough. And, and, and I think that is the, the piece. The other thing I would add to this is that, um, and it hasn't been mentioned yet either, is that um, there's still a premium when you talk to the DMNTERs, there's still a premium in the market to be able to say that not only was the uh, diamond uh, mined in Northwest Territories, in the jurisdiction like the Northwest Territories, but it was also polished here. So there's a premium to that, and other other jewelry companies, in fact, do that right now in Canada, where they have Maple Leaf brand and Canada Mark and those kinds of things. There's still a premium to be able to do that. So I think that's the uh, that's a, another part of it. So and back to the the, the rough part of it is that world um, supply of rough diamonds is in is expected to decline. So manufacturers are looking to whatever jurisdiction they can to access more rough to keep their factories going. So I think there's a number of those pieces uh, as the way I would answer that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Okay, uh, thanks. I, um, okay, I have a better understanding of this now, and I don't think that's set out very clear in the, the policy, that's for sure. In fact, the policy doesn't even contain the matrix. Um, so how, you know, if I didn't get this presentation and understand the point system a little bit better, how is somebody picking up this policy going to understand what this matrix system uh, is all about? Because it's not even in the policy. Uh, uh, is, uh, and, and I looked at the application form. There's just some broad categories of information that, that uh, uh, a potential manufacturer is supposed to provide. But, like... The nuts and bolts of this is actually the matrix. Like you, you would think that somebody would want to target your application and try to score points according to the matrix, but if the matrix isn't even public, how are they going to know this? Uh, is the matrix going to be added to the policy? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Welsh. Mr. Chair, uh, for the member, there will be uh, uh, Following these presentations, there will be a, a number of documents that will be posted online, um, including uh, a Q&A about the, the new diamond policy framework, uh, a backgrounder, and uh, yes, we will be posting the, the matrix and uh, other information on there as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I did even have a quick look at the Q&A, and there's, there's nothing in there about the matrix. Maybe I need to look at it a little bit closer, but... Uh, I think the communications around this probably need to be clarified a little bit. Um, I want to move on to reporting. I see that the companies have to do annual reporting to ITI. That's that's a, a good thing. Um, are those reports from the company, are they going to be public? And how are you going to report publicly on how this is all working out and whether this is actually working as opposed to the old policy that didn't work? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. First, I'll start with Minister Schumann. I think he has something to add to the previous comment. I don't even remember now. What was I going to say, Kevin? About Matrix. That's the one that stuff public. Oh, the, 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 we just, no, 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 it's not. Uh, we just rolled this out today, and that's the reason that a lot of this stuff isn't online yet. So once we f conclude with, uh, with this meeting today, this stuff is going to be posted as soon as possible. So that's one of the reasons that stuff <coughs> isn't there yet. But as far as the other questions, well, I'm going to defer it to Miles. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the results and, and uh, of the the audit and that information will not be public. That is proprietary information that could detrimentally affect detrimentally uh, 
affect a manufacturer's business. Thank you. Further, further to that, Mr. Jensen. I would, I would uh, respond to the member's uh, question around how will we know whether or not this policy is being successful vis-a-vis -vis the other one. Uh, we will know by virtue of the activity that's actually happening in the territory. We will see people here. We will see them manufacturing. We will see them uh, making their diverse investments, and we'll certainly have an ability to track that. So that would be the difference, because right now there's not very much actually happening uh, in the territory. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Hall. Can I add to that? <clears throat> Just a little bit on how we're going to monitor these. So like Miles had mentioned in his conversation, in 2014, upon devolution, there was FARA at that time, financial analysis and financial and royalty analysis created. And since then, we've evolved to um, take in the secondary industry. But what that team has given us is it's given us a full audit function. So we will be intensely monitoring these through stringent reporting, similar to tax returns filed annually. We'll be monitoring their financial statements. Um, they'll be required to provide us with their operating expenditures. And we'll be doing a detailed audit similar to those that we do on the royalty returns. So with that, we'll be able to ensure that they are meeting their requirements and their commitments. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So I, I'm looking at page six of the uh, actual policy um, to see what this section heading here is. Uh, reporting. And so the company companies that are, I guess, an approved NWT diamond manufacturer, they have to submit an annual report to GNWT de detailing the extent to which the company has achieved objectives, projections, goals, uh, uh, agree, uh, manufacture the agreed upon volume. Uh, they've sold diamonds with a GNWT licensed trademark, employed and retained the, tar the target number of employees, create investment opportunities for residents, um, support NWT businesses, create training positions, uh, create other economic spin offs. I'm not sure, is any of that proprietary? And why can't that kind of information be, if it can't be shared on an individual uh, uh, approved manufacturer basis, why can't it be rolled up on an annual basis? The diamond mining companies have to do this already in terms of some of the socioeconomic reporting that they do. So why can't this kind of information be made public? Thanks, Mr. Chair. So that we can actually see if this is working or not. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I wholeheartedly agree. I think we, we can uh, report this as a total aggregate. We just want to get into the proprietary stuff of each individual business. But I think going forward, we, you can probably see us reporting it as a total aggregate in our reports. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks. I think um, the problem is if you've only got one manufacturer, what you're going to do. Um, and that's how this is going to start off. But, you know, you need to clarify this in your policy, whether those reports are going to be public or not, and how you're going to report public process or public progress on this. That's just part of good accountability. So uh, a, a couple of suggestions there for you to think about about improving the, the policy itself. It might have been better if we'd had a chance to look at this as a draft. Um, the last point I want to make, Mr. Chair, this won't be very popular, but um, I understand trying to get benefits from the secondary industry, and uh, uh, that's good, and I think this is probably starting to move in a better direction. We're going to trade off access to rough so that they can, and then they're going to be allowed to export some of the stuff because we haven't been able to get those two things working together. But if you really want to get benefits, uh, from uh, diamond mining. You know, you've talked about how there's basically one and a half billion dollars of diamonds leaving the Northwest Territories every year. The real way to get benefits from that is to review the royalty regime and increase the amount of government revenues that we keep from diamond mining uh, through the royalty regime. You can also look at Deb Swana as, a, as another example of, of uh, state ownership or co-investment in, in an enterprise. You guys have all of those kinds of ideas that have been set out for you in at least two independently commissioned reports uh, that your department has uh, looked at. So what are you doing on those fronts to mesh with 
how you're trying to uh, improve uh, benefit retention from the secondary industry. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those are two totally separate things. I, we've had this discussion in the House. Uh, we are deferring royalties to the 19th Legislative mm -hmm. Assembly. The 19th Assembly can have a look at it. Uh, when we roll out our MRA, uh, we are not looking at it. We've clearly stated that in the House. The 19th Assembly can have a look at it. They can have a decide if they want to have their own separate act even around royalties and have their whole have that thing separate from the Mineral Resource Act or whatever they want to do. That's for, not for me to decide on that. But it's definitely been deferred to the 19th Assembly. This policy and framework that we're moving around, Diamond Policy Framework, is to, to try to capture some benefits for the Northwest Territories that clearly have not worked since 1999. And I think the Department has done a great amount of work and it clearly states the immediate benefits that we can have from this framework for residents of the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks. Um, I think the, there are potential benefits from this. This is going to take a long time, a long time to to get up and going. Um, I don't think it's something. I think I think it is something that we can pursue. But when our royalty uh, or the the royalties that we keep from diamond mining. You know, our total royalties post division are between 17 and 60 million dollars. On one and a half billion dollars that are leaving the Northwest Territories, we're not getting a fair return. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Comment noted. Next, I have Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just a couple of qu <coughs> questions in regards to I think it's on slide six. It talks about the maximum asset at 10 percent. So is that 10 percent of total production? Or is that 10% uh, yearly production? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, you're, uh, that is 10% of the annual production. So essentially, the, the producers are required at each um, evaluation, based on value, at each valuation to identify 10% of that allocation that could be made available for Northwest Territories diamond manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson. Mm, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I thank you for that answer. So, what happens if we don't access this? We don't. So, where does say we only use four percent the year coming up? What happens to the other six percent? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that rough uh, belongs to the producers, and it is put back in the international market for sale. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank Mr. Walsh for that answer. So what percentage have we used since that's what scares me? So what, uh, yeah, what's the highest that we've used? Have we used any of that percentage um, at all since these diamond mines have been opened up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Thank you. Ms. Strand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The records that we have is that on an annual basis, the most that was ever accessed and cut in the Northwest Territories amounted to $20 million. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, could we get a percentage? Because, I mean, we're talking, is that $20 million based on, I guess I'm, you know, it, it's what I'm just trying to do is understand. Yeah, I wanna, what I want to try to do is understand what it is of the yearly production. So if it, the year was 20, per, 20 million, was that 10%? Was it 5%? Thank you, Mr. Chair. What percent of the maximum 10 was 20 million worth in that given year? Mr. Welsh. Yeah, we, we can certainly get the, the answers for the members. I can say that it, it is uh, less than 1%. Thank you. Yeah. Part of the reason for a revision of a policy, Mr. Yeah. Thompson. Yeah. Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I understand why this policy is now in front of the committee there. So, um, so will we see with this new policy, do you feel, I guess, are we going to be able to see an increase in um, maximizing that 10 percent? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we clearly think we're, we're on to something here. That's why we've brought this forward. That's why we've made the policy change. Uh, you know, 
<coughs> you talk about the 20 million, but that that can go back to one year between now and 1999. We don't even know what the year the production was for that year. But right now, we're clearly not getting anything, not a thing. We want to put this policy forward. I've clearly said that uh, that uh, Diamonds International and others are very interested in the new policy change and looking at setting up here. And uh, we have a goal of having the you know three to four to five new manufacturers in the Northwest Territories in the coming years. And there's lots of interest out there. And uh, contrary to some other people in this room that believe that this policy is going to take a long time to take effect, I do not think that is the case. You're going to see some immediate results. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Thompson? Uh, just uh, one, I guess, hopefully last question here. So presently we have one company that's already here or is developing, and then we have Diamond International. So we, we have two that are looking at. Is that correct? Am I understanding? Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we currently have two approved Northwest Territories diamond manufacturers, and that is Crossworks Manufacturing Limited and Alma, Alma Diamonds. We do engage in, continually in discussion with uh, other global manufacturers. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you. I guess this other one. Um, so I guess this is for the minister. Will the minister commit to updating committee on you know the success w w you guys are having with these manufacturers as we move forward on this policy thank thank you mr chair thank you minister schumann thank you mr chair as we uh, roll this out then we will certainly keep uh committee engaged on where we're at and the successes we have thank you mr chair thank you nothing further next i have mr testart thank you mr chair uh, the, the minister just said uh, that there's several companies kind of waiting to invest once once we get moving on the the policy changes is that was that accurate or just <coughs> if we're sitting on you know new investment perhaps um, i mean i would be interested to know that if we're going to expect a few more approved diamond manufacturers to start operating in the northwest territories thank you thank you minister schumann thank you mr chair if we check the record i said there was some clearly some interest in coming to the northwest territories uh one of the one of the Probably the most engaged sessions we have is when we go to JCK in Las Vegas every year around the, the diamond manufacturing in the Northwest Territories. Myself and the Premier have both been there a number of times, and uh, that's where a number of these discussions take place because that's where most of the people in the international markets uh, congregate to have these discussions around diamonds in, in the North American market, and particularly the discussions with us around the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? further next I have mr. McNeely thank you thank you uh, mr. chair um, I gotta admit I am not really familiar with this diamond industry altogether having not been privileged to make a field tour but on on the basis of capturing the the, the benefits from the downstream or secondary secondary industry um, I, I I support what I, what I hear, and in, in 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 some degree, I kind of visualize uh, similar processes in in the area, in in my area. If you have Husky Energy negotiating an an IBA or an Access and Benefits Agreement with the Toledo District Land Corporation, <coughs> I would say that's confidential, and it has been mentioned it's confidential but as far as the reporting of benefits it's identified in the exploration license so that material and that data is <coughs> issued and reported annually so so what what we've discussed at the leadership level we're quite satisfied with that type of atmosphere and honoring and respecting the land corporations in their developments of the access and benefits agreement themselves <coughs> so i i just look forward to uh, seeing some results from the presentation here if it happens thank you mr chair thank you we'll take that as a comment to the comment comment noted thank you i have mr o'reilly uh thanks i don't want our guests to go away thinking that i I don't like mining, so, uh, um, you know, I, I remember about, it was 2002, sitting in the, uh, uh, one of the 
rooms in the basement of the Yellowknife Inn, I was questioning somebody from De Beers during the, the EA for the environmental assessment for Gachukui about whether De Beers was prepared to um, make a commitment, a binding commitment, that they would sell rough diamonds from their project. They had never done that before, and they did agree to do it. And it was because I was questioning them about it. So I want to retain the benefits from these. So um, I'm just not sure this is going to do it. But um, my understanding of the diamond chain, and this is from Martin Irving, who used to work for you guys years and years ago, was that um, a lot of the value added comes way at the, the end of the process when you turn diamonds into jewelry. That's the greatest uh, value that, that uh, in, in the whole Mar uh, chain it, that as you move further down the value added is greater so at what point is um, an approved manufacturer going to be able to export diamonds from here under this new policy uh, after they, they uh, do some cutting and polishing after they set it in, in, uh, in uh, fittings for jewelry at what point are they going to be able to export stuff and how, because what we're really doing is trading off that value added to try to get the benefits from from the cutting and polishing. That's what this looks like to me. And if I'm wrong, someone should tell me that. But where in that that chain are they going to be able to export? And uh, am I right about the trade-offs? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the company. The companies we are working with, and we will we will always continue to work with, are vertically integrated companies. And these companies have their operations where they are well distributed throughout the value chain, as as the member said, from procuring rough to manufacturing rough to creating rough and to selling uh, to, to creating jewelry and selling jewelry. And uh, if a manufacturer brings forth a, a proposal. Uh, they will obviously be allowed to start their operation, and the the reporting is done on an annual basis. We're not uh, we're not supporting startups or whatever. These these individuals have to have the chance to be able to to start their operation. The you're correct in that the the least amount of profit in the value chain is in that's where the margins are tightest is in the cutting and the polishing. But the manufacturers we're working with are well supported throughout the value chain from start to finish. Yeah. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Okay, so that confirms one of my uh, hypotheses here. So, at what point are they going to be able to export uh, stuff after they've cut and polished it, or as finished jewelry, or is that something that's going to be negotiated? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, those are those are based on the of course the business decisions of the manufacturer but the way we have have set it up in terms of working with the producers and the manufacturers in in processing these goods if uh, a manufacturer presents his business plan we run it through the matrix and make the analysis and agree that this is a an agreed upon route to go the we will work with the producer and we'll just we'll just for example use 70 percent the producer will prepare two sales parcels one 30 percent that would come back to Yellowknife and be manufactured here and the other 70 percent that when it is sold can be uh, exported by the manufacturer uh, in, in rough okay. thank, thank you mr. You. further mr. O'Reilly yeah okay that's getting a little murkier but so it's not just that these are going to definitely be cut and polished here. They may be exporting rough diamonds, the the, the approved manufacturers. That's so they're they're going to become suppliers themselves of rough diamonds to perhaps even third parties. Is that what this could allow? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Uh, so the whole the whole intent of the policy. I don't know if. if if the member's got his head wrapped around it. Right now, 150 million, <coughs> the 10 percent that's allocated to the manufacturers is not getting done yet. The producers are exporting that anyway. So we're not getting no benefication out of it. What this new policy is going to allow, depending on where you fall in the matrix, based on Miles' assumption, or say we do the 70 percent, 30 percent has to be kept in Northwest Territories polished uh, based on your, on your business plan. You're making jewelry, you're fully integrated. Yes, you can take your 70% at any time and export that off. 
off. You can sell it, you can send it to a different manufacturer, send it to a different country, get polished, that's up to you. But that's already leaving here at this point right now. The point of us is trying to make <coughs> the same work is there has to be some way to make this work for a manufacturer to come here and invest in the Northwest Territories, hire people, uh, have a fully integrated system was preferable and leave some beneficiation for residents of the Northwest Territories. Right now we're not, we are not retaining one dollar of this the way things are set up right now. And since 1999, that, like they said, the highest number we've done is 20 million whatever year that was and we don't even know what, how much production was that year. But we have to figure out a way that makes it economical for someone to invest in the Northwest Territories to be able to do this and through the collaboration with the people we've worked with like Constell and stuff, this is what we've come up with and we believe that this will work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm <laughs> feeling less comfortable with this as we go along, but um, uh, what is there to stop a, uh, an approved manufacturer then from bringing diamonds from elsewhere, cutting and polishing them here, and selling them as NWT diamonds? Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Welsh. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I almost said Mr. Speaker, sorry. Um, we have a monitoring process in place. So for rough that is brought in, any NWT rough that is brought back and manufactured through, we can count that for stone for stone through the factory. If a manager chooses to enhance his operation and pr pr process other rough through there, we will be able to monitor that rough as well. And we, we unless he's a part of our certification program, this is the NWT rough, and that is his other rough. We won't certify it as NWT rough whatsoever. All we will do is separate streams and monitor it through the factory. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, yeah, uh, look, I don't want to flog uh, away here too much, although uh, how do you certify or how do you um, ensure that the NWT diamonds stay separate from the other ones? Um, you know, there's been an entire international Kimberley process to that tries to do this. So how are we going to do replicate something like that here in the Northwest Territories to make sure that our branded NWT diamonds don't get mixed in with stuff that might be coming from elsewhere? Thanks. Thank and, you. and you know, if if the uh, our witnesses want to give something in writing so I can understand that better, I I'm happy to get it later. Think there's a process Thanks. in place, Mr. Welsh. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for, for, pro for, pro for product that comes in, the 30% that comes in, if the manufacturer is part of our certification program, we will tag, that would end up being lasered and numbered. If he's not part, we will still, as an entity, monitor that through, stone by stone, through the entire process. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. <laughs> Sorry. Further to that, Ms. Strand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, <clears throat> this process is best seen in person, so uh, we would like to offer to take away um, potentially looking into the opportunity for a standing committee to get a tour of the facility so they could actually see how diamonds move through the process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, I'd uh, be happy to do that, especially if there's free samples. Um, but... Uh, uh, look, uh, no, I, I, I think I'd find that quite helpful because uh, then I might better understand this. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Anything further from committee? Nothing further at this time. I want to thank the minister and his staff for coming and presenting to us today. Again, we're uh, very pleased to see that there are some um, steps and measures being taken with regards to much needed and long overdue improvements to the secondary diamond industry and its respective policies. Um, as we know, um, this industry has struggled almost out of the gate um, since diamonds have started in the Northwest Territories and if we're all agreeing that the diamond industry uh, or at least the existing mines are kind of on the back side of their lives, well then, uh, frankly, we don't have too much time to waste in terms of getting this right. So I want to thank you again for coming and presenting today. We look forward to uh, working with you going forward. We certainly look forward to the tour. And I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Schumann, for uh, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, for committee, for hearing what we had to offer you today. 
uh, we'll correspond through the chair and offer, like we said, the tour with the uh, with the diamond policy and what we what we have to offer through our department and uh, set up a date so everyone can have a first hand look at that. And I believe we made another commitment that we will follow up on as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. With that, we can be adjourned. Thanks. Another break.